Hey man, how's it going? I'm great. Uh, my name is Sufian. I'm uh, from uh, Darkside Records, and I am very, very honored to talk to you personally. Uh, one of my legends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we're gonna start this episode, the second episode of the Moroccan Close Encounters, known as the MCE Project. And uh, I present to you Umeima, who's the host me. of this episode. I learned that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, later you will be talking to Amin, uh, the Moroccan artist, and you would be the American one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I'm in a hotel, so if the signal is weak or it drops, it's at the mercy of hotel Wi-Fi. No, no, the best. it's no, loud it's, and clear. It's loud and clear. So okay, uh, I will go now and leave you uh, with Amin. And uh, have fun. All right. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So hi again. Welcome to the Moroccan Close Encounters. It's a great pleasure to host you and to have you with us. Along my side is Amin, one of the finest bass players here we have in Morocco. He's like on the top five. Here he, co he came all the way from Marrakesh for this interview. So I'm intrigued personally to know about your personal experience with the COVID. I mean, my research told me that you caught the virus. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes, so after testing positive because of coronavirus, how did you manage to stay active? How did you manage to, to, to remain within music? I mean, did it like affect you personally? I contacted the virus along with a lot of guys that were on the same tour. You might have heard the big news, Testament, yeah. Exodus, Death Angel. There's quite a few of us. Um, I guess most of the main news that came out was about the band members, but we had a whole lot of crew members that got wow. it too. You know, those kind of guys don't make the news, but mm -hmm. it, it kind of, you know, inflated the numbers of us that, that got sick. And um, just like you've seen over this past year, everyone gets affected in different, different ways, ways, different level. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge variation. Mm -hmm. So some of the guys were kind of surprised they tested positive because they didn't feel much. Yeah. And then there was a, there was like a middle group that was definitely sick mm -hmm. that made sense that they were positive. I was on probably the far end of the middle group because I got hit super hard. Wow. I was, yeah, we had one guy that was beyond the hard group. You might have heard of Will, the drummer from Death Angel. He yes. went to the, yeah, he was in a coma for like 12 days, oh. had heart trouble. He's doing good now, so it's that's good. Feels, that's good news too. Feels hear good to recount now. what happened to him, you know, because it has a good, um, well, not ending, but you know, he's doing fine now. <laughs> that's good. Um, but, but for me, man, I I just knew the. It hit me like during the night, like kind of when I woke up, like mm -hmm. four or five in the morning. I just knew something was wrong. I mean, you really sweating and everything. Yeah. You just feel like crap, man. Something has taken over me, man. I'm possessed with something. And, wow. At first, I went to the local hospital. They have, you know, just to go say, like, like, hey, I feel sick. Maybe I should get a test. And they denied me because I had walked out of my car up to the door. They're like, no, you're not sick enough. I'm like, okay. okay so, so Okay, that's why. That's, that's yeah, really weird. Yeah, so I just went and stayed in bed. And then after another week of it not going away, I went to this other clinic. And they talked to me through the window of my car. And they're like, uh, well... The tests are only for really sick people, so we're not going to test you. So I, another full week in bed, I mean, completely Torn. devastated. Yeah. I was like, I mean, there's not a lot of sickness to say about it. I did have a cough, but I've had worse coughs. It was a bad cough, but not my worst cough ever. But there's nearly not much else. There's like no upset stomach, no head cold. Yeah. It's just this massive drain of energy yeah. just this complete exhaustion like the the fever just crushes you and you i would i would get out of bed and walk real slow down the hall to get a glass of water and by the time i got to my bed i was exhausted for the next two hours wow. like it it took it out of me so by the third week we had called like this telemed you know like they're starting to improve things so they're like mm -hmm. hey let's just talk to people on the phone so we don't interact and that doctor was like wait a minute three weeks okay, I've already authorized a test for you. Drive to this location, whatever. And they gave me a test. And sure enough, like maybe two days later or something, the result came in positive. And so then it hit me in, not not that it was a surprise, because... You already clearly, knew. Yeah, I knew it, but I didn't know it. So when the positive result came on, it's like, okay, what are we going to do? And then because of the time, 
like three days later, my fever alleviated and I started getting up out of bed. And with a few more days, I was fine. So I only lived with the positive result for a few days, even <laughs> wow. though I had a yeah, I had a steady, like, constant fever for 20 for days 20 without days, break. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's, that's really good news to hear that you're doing fine. I mean, you look fine now. I mean, it's been... It's been a really hard time. I mean, COVID is not that easy. And people are not taking it seriously, but it is a disease. But we're glad you're doing okay. We're happy yeah. to have you doing in full health. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, during that time, I had no energy to do anything, anything at all. Yeah. So, my the room where I have all my music and recording stuff, I didn't even really open the door for the whole month. That's good. But That's good. when I started to get better, and, you know, during this time, I'm getting messages about all these tour cancellations and you know this is the beginning of this whole thing so yeah. at first it was like okay well the the next month has been canceled but we're going to keep the following months and then a message would come in okay well now it's more months more months and then eventually when it hit me that the entire calendar year was off you know because testament's yeah. record testament's record was brand new came out during mm -hmm. the lockdown yeah and so we had the whole year full full of tour dates i mean I that was were all kind of, canceled. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, strange. so the entire year just fell out, and so I started to get kind of like anxiety. Like, what am I gonna do? I gotta survive. So I started putting the word out there that I was available. Mm -hmm. You know, for session recording and mm -hmm. stuff, and thinking like, hopefully I get lucky and somebody hits me up and maybe I can scrape by it's with a little smart. money. But yeah. it it semi backfired because everybody was in lockdown everybody decided to record and a lot of those people needed a bass player and all of a mm. sudden i was overwhelmed with this huge list and the rest of the year i was pretty busy and i actually kind of fell behind some deadlines and that's good so it, that's good to know yeah so i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna jump real quick to i mean like it's it's pretty linked to what you just said right now so he has a question for you right yeah uh, can you tell us a bit about your beginnings beginnings as an artist I mean, I guess sometimes a typical answer would be like, you know, some guys saw a Kiss concert and it changed their life or, <laughs> or you know, wow. something like that. But for me, it's like I was this just a small child and, you know, my mom had a piano in the house and I was always experimenting on the piano and taught myself to read music around the same time I learned mm -hmm. to read uh, you know, words or whatever, to read. To read, and, um, basically. Yeah, so... <laughs> I, I was always fluent in reading, obviously at a small child level, you know, beginner level, but I was always fluent reading music and I always um, involved myself in whatever the school had for music programs and I jumped around and played whatever different instruments were available and, you know, that evolved into, you know, obviously the high school years, the teenage years when yeah. rock and roll starts to hit you and you get the dream and then I started, you know, <laughs> practicing on the side of the bed to records and and developing my you know Skills. kind of yeah yeah well kind of my bit. after school music you know i was mm. fundamentally trained in orchestra and symphonic and jazz band and all that nerdy stuff but once i wanted to get into like picturing myself in a band on stage that was you know probably when i was around 14 or 15 and pretty fresh and then, then it, right. yeah then it probably became like most people like then I started doing that on my own like just learning to play from albums Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and Jethro Tull and Rush stuff like that the bass players you know Blizzard of Oz just came mm -hmm. out and Rainbow mm -hmm. those albums had very prominent bass yeah. fun to play yeah. you know Iron Maiden always a big challenge that kind of stuff accelerated what I wanted to do on my own and so yeah. by the time you know it gave, it was a you, later an idea. It gave you an entire yeah. idea yeah and, then, and then, then we hooked up with friends and made our own bands and started doing stuff on her on more of a self -taught and you emerged way. like that like, yeah like a wolf flower <laughs> 35 years later here i am <laughs> here you are <laughs> so what what is what is the main reason that make you play the bass well kind of like how i just said i you know many years developing as a child went through different instruments yeah. it seems like i always gravitated towards the lower instruments when the woodwind class was available i played bass clarinet and then when I moved over to brass, I played tuba, you know, really huge, huge instrument, brass yeah. instrument. And then in jazz band, I, I played the bass trombone. It's a little bigger than mm -hmm. the normal trombone line mm -hmm. and stuff. So it was always kind of something I just, I don't know, instinctively gravitated to. It was, it was the part of the music that I liked. And when I watched 
you know, music on TV or go to concerts, I seem to focus on mm -hmm. the bass player back there mm -hmm. having fun. So it just kind of instinctively appealed to me. So yeah. once I got an electric bass, I knew that I was going to stay on that instrument and quit jumping around and changing and focus and get good at something. So, so you just made us like skip an, our next question. Yeah. I mean, you just told us about the entire instruments that you had played for 35 years. I mean, we were intrigued <laughs> about asking that question, but you answered it like pretty fluently, uh, pretty fast. Yeah. So in, uh, what is uh, the main, the main uh, influences? I mean, why did you include bass into heavy metal? Yeah. Okay. Why and how? Well, and yeah, I got you. I guess, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I guess when in those in those kind of formative years I told you about learning from bass players like Geddy Lee, yes. Chris Squire, you know, Geezer Butler, Steve Harris, that that appealed to me to to play heavy. And you know, the style of music when we made our own band was brand new. You know, they actually just you know, once you had heavy metal on MTV, everything that was less popular was just basically called speed metal. <laughs> and the word thrash is what the audience did. It's what yeah. the crowd did to each other. Yeah. And then slowly evolved to where the style of music we played took the name thrash. And so it was just that kind of like, you know, like Judas Priest, except that mm -hmm. kind of stuff just mm -hmm. played a lot faster. And then we started discovering bands like Slayer, Merciful Fate, wow, yeah. you know, all the, all that stuff mixed together, except Anvil, Metal Church, all the, all the newer wave coming up yeah. we just emulated that that was our thing and so to play the bass for that kind of music i had to learn to play really fast mm -hmm. but i had a huge like jazz background so i wasn't always focused on copying guitar players a lot of bass players just kind of shadow the guitar mm -hmm. where i was from a more fundamental and like a jazz background where wow. it was where bass was looking for counter that's, that's a massive or, switch yeah. yeah, like creating pockets mm -hmm. with the drums and stuff, but doing that in super fast heavy metal, it's different. So it was it was all brand new to me. I didn't have a lot of people to look up to in, in the hyper speed style stuff. <laughs> so I just found my own way. And once I started bringing Fretless into it, it kind of made people like double take, like, what the heck is that? But <laughs> for me, it was old school. And, and yeah, so I guess a little footnote to the end of that is, you know, this a lot of musicians are infected with this competitive vibe you know where they want to say who's better or whatever i, when yeah, I was, I was about young, to I ask this one i mean i was about to ask you like give me like first thing that comes into your mind like four names that pops up into your your mind about well like, i can tell you that i realized at a young age that there really in music there is no such thing as the best that's, because that's, it's all subjective that's a great you know, answer what, yeah. like <clears throat> and so it, i always found that no matter how much i improved i always saw someone playing better than me and I didn't let it bother me I, it gave me inspiration to jump up to, you know to, to realize there was another level to advance to so I decided it's worthless to try to be the best mm -hmm. but I knew that there's a possibility to be very different and maybe the most different so mm -hmm. my quest wasn't always to be better better it was always to be just different something unique something that mm -hmm. gives that kind of like you said like that signature sound exactly. so that's kind of how I developed my sound, I guess, is just not playing like other people. I wasn't trying to outdo them. I was yeah. just trying to do it my own way. Your you know? own way. I mean, different is always a good idea. Yeah. So I guess you'll be hearing something different, right? I mean, okay, so he's going to play something that I wish you recognized, okay? You will recognize, okay? So go ahead, I mean. Within the first 
first few seconds, it's I, I the, the title of the song escapes me, but it's from Control Denied, and I even hear the lyrics going on and everything. So I just, I, God, I haven't heard that record in like 20 years. So <laughs> the title escapes me, but that's from Control Denied. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> what what is the title? Tell me so I don't look so stupid. <laughs> Tu lui dis, euh, c'est quoi le titre de la chanson Expect the, the unexpected. Exactly. Ah, uh, right, right, right. <laughs> wow, cool. That's cool that you know, you know that, man. I, ju it, I, just every... learned, I just learned it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, he learned it yesterday and he added like some of his yeah. own personal touch just because he knew he was coming to this interview. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a huge honor for me to hear <laughs> something you. I recorded so 20 much. years ago played by... The top, one of the top five bass players in Morocco. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. That means a lot. Everybody knows that uh, that uh, you ex play ex bass player for for the legendary band Dead. So can you tell tell us uh, about your experience along alongside uh, with Chuck? <laughs> well, how much time do you got? I don't know. <laughs> you have like top chrono five, let's say four minutes. <laughs> Okay, I don't have the time. No, it's just because um, I have the unique experience of being alongside Chuck from the mutilation demo in 1988 all the way until the time he passed mm -hmm. when we were working on the second Control Denied demo. Obviously, I was in and out of the lineup, not completely steady. I mean, we were friends steady the whole time. Um, but, you know, the, the two albums most known for, obviously, Human and Individual Thought, Top Patterns 91 and 93. Mm -hmm. That's when I spent a huge amount of time with him because you know we wrote the songs, did the studio, and went on tour. <clears throat> we we actually we did spend a lot of time together in 1987, 88. Wow. Um, wow. During the production phase of Scream Bloody Gore, we did okay. you know we were like 17, 18, oh, about 18 years old, I guess. Um, Pretty young. Yeah, and so we were just. You know, hanging out at night, hiding in a park somewhere, drinking beer, talking about, you know, brand new death metal stuff. And he was he was pretty normal, you know, <laughs> teenager back then. He the only thing he was not normal in is how focused and driven he was. This guy had a mission to make this band his life, and it's cool because we got to see how it turned out, and he did exactly. it. He was right. But and then you know, like I said, that mid section of the career in the early 90s I spent a lot of time seriously with him got to be on the albums although I did return for the pre-production of Symbolic in 94 mm -hmm. um, didn't stay around for the studio but in the exact same thing I came back in 97 mm -hmm. and worked a lot on Perseverance songs didn't stay for the studio and then by 99 I came back for Control <laughs> Denied so in and out, in and out. With yeah. The, yeah yeah but But even so, I mean, we were pretty tight and we trusted each other musically. Um, so my story is pretty different from a lot of the ex-members because some guys had a real short time with him and some guys had a bad experience and split for whatever reason. But, But nobody, yeah, nobody really spans that whole period of time, you know. So mm -hmm. obviously being super close friends with him I can only recount, you know, really exactly. good stuff. He was a personal friend of mine, so... We had a lot, lot more in common than music, you know. We both loved going hiking and canoeing mm -hmm. and and just having barbecues outside. And when we spent little time inside, yeah. we were just really just like crazy nature children, you know, just just hanging out with animals and <laughs> just doing what friends do, you know. But it was fortunate that he, you know, brought me into his world yeah. of music because yeah. clearly that put me on the map, you know. Yeah, if, it did. You know, if I just continue with Sadis, who knows? We had a very small cult following and who knows what it would have done for me but death obviously exposed me to a huge world and that's how a lot of the guys around the testament camp found me and and so on you know so death was a huge huge big important first step of obviously my whole career and so i guess you just ruined our next question again god is... i've been doing that a lot yeah, you've been doing that quite a lot up. actually it's pretty good it's not something bad huh? but Uh, but the question was, if we gave you death and testament, which one comes first? Well, well, testament was obviously multitudes bigger than death. I mean, they were mm -hmm. played on the FM radio and MTV, and mm -hmm. death was a struggling underground yeah. death metal band. So as far as exposure and fame, I mean, testament's a more important band. Mm -hmm. But there would, 
I don't, like I just said, I don't think I would have got a chance to exactly. be in test so. if people didn't know me from death. So which comes first? Death chronologically obviously came first. Chron yeah, testament. I mean, chronologically, let's say, yes, death <laughs> comes first. Well, yeah, 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 but within you. And also the last activity of death was 1998, and that's exactly, exactly the summer that I first joined Testament. Testament so yeah. they didn't even overlap. So I don't, it's one continuous line for me, and I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, it's hard to say. <laughs> hugely important band so what would i do without that i would be nothing but death put me on the map for testament to find me it's impossible That's to say really with one answer. yeah it so is. i'll just leave it one one continues i love all my children <laughs> <laughs> okay you can ask him this one yeah. yeah so any upcoming projects yeah um a lot of them of actually course. just have, <laughs> yeah yeah, where do I freaking start? She's only giving me four minutes per answer, and I'm taking 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you can start with something exclusive that no one knows, maybe. <laughs> well, um, just this month, two albums, two separate albums came out. I worked with a band out of Denmark called Mother of All. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was just released, and they did some cool online promotion. It's a trio, mm -hmm. so it's kind of organic and, you know, uh, very musical, very... Uh, eclectic kind of stuff mm -hmm. check out mother of all yes sir <laughs> and the same day um an album i had been working on for years and even if my part was years the band really started years before they recruited me so <laughs> it's like one of those really really slow projects to develop but it finally came out on frontier records it's a band from norway it's called terra odium it's like terra a odium. latin mm -hmm. yeah it's um couple of the guys from Spiral Architect, if people know that kind of, it, they put out one album, very progressive technical stuff, but it's that one album. And the bass player, Lars Norbert, like anybody who's got serious chops lo, no, uh, knows <laughs> Lars. Yeah, yeah I could. It's but okay. uh, so Spiral Architect was a, like a huge, huge, you know, cult following for a lot of progressive metal players mm -hmm. and stuff and and so the drummer and the singer from that band mm -hmm. are in this project called terra odium that album came out and that's it's pretty well yeah it's pretty good stuff it's, it's, good it's stuff, yeah. very difficult to play it took me i had to kind of up my level to finish mm -hmm. the recording it was it was pretty tough so if you're looking for something you know real adventurous and kind of mathematical that's the terra odium's good um an album that i'm still waiting I mean, all I'm hearing is album, album, album. That's, that's great. Yeah, it's, that's, well, it's, that's a lot of I work. Do, I do record a lot normally, but this past year of lockdown, there's been like, just that's it. There's no stage work, so <laughs> us musicians go, yeah, we go right for the red light. You know, just yeah. record, record, record. So, yeah, um, there's another band I finished up with late last year, and their album's in production. Mm -hmm. I don't have a release date. It's got to be soon because. It's been done for a while, but it's I mean, called... I mean, you sure you don't have a release date for us? Not for this band. They <laughs> told me later this year, maybe August. And okay. the band name is called um, Act of Denial. Act of it's Denial. A, yeah, it's a guitar duo from Croatia, and then they hired everybody else. They got Bjorn from Soilwork yeah. and, and his buddy on keyboards from Sweden. And um, the drummer is Krim. He's an Austrian drummer, killer chops and stuff. So... The Active Denial is cool. I guess it kind of fits in that kind of melodic death metal vein. So they're very, pretty similar to like Soil Work in Flames kind of oh. stuff. You know, good speed, but good melody kind of mixed together. So that's a lot of the recent stuff that's, you know, out or coming soon. And then I'm on kind of a continuous trip right now with multiple projects I'm doing. Um, one of which is another a return to a band that I've recorded with a couple times called mm -hmm. Gone in April. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of a symphonic metal, metal, yeah. metal, me metal. <laughs> <laughs> um, God, there's, I'm going in the studio in Nashville in just a few days and man, I wish I could tell you that because to break that news on your show would be freaking gigantic, but 
Not allowed to say not who allowed. it is yet. Oh, not, not even allowed, like a few words. Come on. <laughs> no, but in the future when the news is released, you'll say, oh, gosh, now we know why. Now we know why he wouldn't say anything. Yeah, so it's one of those, stay tuned, it's really big, but I can't tell you, which is kind of useless, but that's how it is. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, one, uh, if, uh, if me and I mean right here flew you to Morocco right now, like at this moment, what would be the first thing you want to visit or do? Oh, if, if I could be magically transported yeah, to Morocco. Yeah, magically transported to Morocco. Ah, oh, I mean, so you're you're testing my knowledge of your country. Exactly. I guess, <laughs> well, all the, I mean, since I've never been there, anything would be You've cool. You've never been I guess here? People, I've never been you there, You need to no. put that on your to-do list. <laughs> yeah. Shit. But I guess I guess a lot of people prefer touristy things, the big market, all that stuff. To me, I would want to go straight to the Atlas Mountains. Oh, I want to. That's yeah, where I'm I wanna, from. I want to see. Yeah. Yeah. The You're high really Atlas, middle Atlas, <laughs> high Atlas, middle Atlas, or anti Atlas? Come on now, tell me. What? What did you say? Uh, the high Atlas, the middle Atlas, or the anti Atlas? The high Atlas. Tell yeah. Me right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I would love to see that. That's the that's the soul of the country. You it know, is. it's nature. It's been there before people. It's been there for before culture, and yeah. that's the kind of stuff I like to absorb. You know, like what comes from the ground, and that yeah. has a lot to do with the way people are, and you know, the whole climate and the fauna and everything. It's yeah. that's what I prefer. I'm total, like I said, I'm total outdoors guy. I prefer the nature. I want to see. The rivers running over the rocks. Yeah. I want to see what kind of trees are there, you know. We have all of this. All yeah. of this. Yeah. I love that stuff. You could submerge me in those mountains and leave me, you know, and I would just love every day of it. Just... I mean, you're welcome to come. I mean, we'll show you around. I'll take you to my grandparents' house. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a kind of a small village, it mountain is. roads? Yes. Ah, oh, beautiful. I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, did you did you have did you have a chance to ch to check some some Moroccan bands? I no, I really can't say I'm familiar with Moroccan bands. I can't think of any really. Um, I don't know how much like like new stuff, modern. No, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know any the the current metal or any. I don't know that. I admit it completely clueless okay. maybe maybe there's a band i heard from morocco and just wasn't aware of them or can't think of them but no i can't at the top of my head i can't say but um i'm really really into a flamenco style from spain i know that's close to you and i know that the andalusian and yeah. i guess they, they they were called like the moors or the moorish people yes. travel so i guess that kind of ties into music from your area yeah. but you know it's kind of it's not so Modern, what, about, I guess. what about Atlas music? I mean, you said you're a big fan of the Atlas Mountains, but you've never checked Atlas music? Uh, if I can't even name one Moroccan band, I couldn't tell you the difference I between... Go straight to YouTube and like, Atlas Music Mountains Morocco. First sure. thing that pops up. <laughs> You'll I love it. Done some... <laughs> uh, it. This might be funny to you. I know a Moroccan song called, and excuse me, obviously my pronunciation, okay. don't know, but it is it called Gulula Mama. Gulul Mama? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, you know, so I I like that kind of music. It's it might be kind of funny and stuff, but you know, for someone so far away in a different part of the world, that sounds really it cool. You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it, you know, obviously not my favorite or main influence, but it's but it's Moroccan it. and topical, and and I say Galula Mama, Galula Mama. Mama. <laughs> <laughs> I so love that stuff. our our last question for this. Moroccan closing culture would be, do you have like any advice to all of our artists here in Morocco? I mean, they would love to have a little message from you if you can share some advices or anything. I mean, anything you've experienced, any like, uh, I don't know, something funny that happened in your career, something that you like you fixed instantly that happened on stage, anything. I mean, anything, anything at all. Yeah, the do I have advice questions always really hard and vague because it's you know as an older guy you like something to be pretty specific but I do like to say and and pass on to people especially younger people yes. that have this motivation and and you know drive to do something I would encourage greatly to 
push your own ideas. Don't be afraid of something mm-hmm. different. And it seems like I depressingly so I almost want to say like the past 25 years seems to be a sort of stagnation. Mm-hmm. It's almost really, really accepted for everybody to be okay with. I could do that too. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, they, they hear a band they like or a sound and then mm-hmm. they form their own band and they emulate it so emulate, much. Yeah. It's getting into the copycat, like just the saturating the pool with a mm-hmm. lot of the same stuff. I'm not saying everybody does that, but there's a lot of it and it's, it's just so accepted to like this. Hey, check out this new band. They sound like so-and-so and you put it on and it Something sounds exactly like it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, that might be fun for somebody to excel to a level Mm -hmm. because of their recognizability, but it doesn't last long. You see it time and time again. A band will shoot to fame, Mm -hmm. but then it dies out quick because the longevity is just not there. They lack originality. And Mm -hmm. when I was younger, and I'm not even really like from the 60s where everything was so experimental (laughs) and stuff, but I was, I did grow up in the 70s listening to those guys. You know, they were in their... 30s and and professionals and I was young grooming myself and every band sounded completely different yeah Yeah, and and every album of those bands came out and it was a big change Mm -hmm. you know these bands were really looking to progress and change their sound and everything and that's something that I thought we were all supposed to do you know and then this big saturation and this kind of you know plague of just everybody doing the same thing over and over and over it gets old and so my advice encouragement is just you know man we we've had over two decades of the same kind of thing let's let's do something something new new. there's massive technology out there we could you know if if you want to go back to the roots and play acoustic or if you want to incorporate i mean technology right yeah just whatever let's get some atlas music and mix it with (laughs) glass beats yeah yeah, and mix it and I mean, give us something authentic. Yeah. Just, tr- just reach out. Try to be, you know, because imagine I was there in a birth of, in, in just a random example, not yeah. even the main example, okay. but, a, but a band like Primus. Yeah. You know, all these thrash metal bands are are fighting for space, and everybody's trying to grow their fan base, and then Primus comes along, and you're like, what the hell is this? It was so completely different. And they were playing for 10 or 12 people at first. Yeah. And then it grew to 50, then 200. And then all of a sudden, they're one of the biggest bands in the world. You hear their their song on the um, the intro track to South Park. I mean, they're, they're huge, you know, yeah. because they took that unique quality and they pushed, pushed it in people's yeah. face. And people do want it. They do want something new and different. It's hard at first. It's really hard. And I think that's why people are content to repeat things is because it's comfortable and it's accepted and you go faster. But if you just endure, you know, people not knowing what to think at first, I think it's worth it in the long run. And And so, yeah, that's my advice, man. Let's let's try something different. Thank you so much. Create something new. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You thank so you much. for your time and thank you for, for saying all these beautiful words and everything. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this interview. I'd love to welcome back Sufiane. Thank, thank you so much, Steve, <laughs> and thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for joining us, and what a huge honor to watch you play the bass, man. That was, so that made you my day. That was me. really, really great, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I'd love to welcome Sufiane here. Um, so how was the this uh, encounter? Uh, if I shall say. Um, How was it? I mean, he's trying to Ah. test us. I mean, he wants to know how we did. Yeah, because... uh, Ironically speaking. You created created the baseline for the philosopher and I created this project to talk to you about what you did. Exactly. And this is my baby. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay. Um, It went really great. You guys had really cool, interesting questions, obviously, because I'm long-winded and I don't know when to shut up. But um, (laughs) No, no, it's uh, it's something Something new never happened to me. I never saw a fellow bass player play one of my bass lines during the interview. That was great. Uh, And that's how far your music went into the Atlas. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm, and it, yeah, that combined with just joining people from a country that's new to me. I've been all around the world for many years, but nothing Morocco, no, no connection to you know Northwest Africa or anything. So this is brand new, and it's a huge honor to join you guys. It's been a lot of fun. And thank oh, you for having so me. He should and come, it's right? a huge honor to talk to you. Yeah. 
It is. So you should come. Definitely come. Yeah, that's uh, that's on you right now. That's on you. you right now. You should <laughs> definitely come. <laughs> Uh, I promise I will try. Thank you. you. Know, Thank you. You get my. You'll have my effort for trying. But Thank if you. It happens, we see. At this point, I'm just gonna be lucky if I can go anywhere, anywhere and play. The yeah. world has been shut down too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I I guess this is uh, the we, end. This of is the end, <laughs> and I hope that it's not the last time that we will talk to you. Host you. No. No, I'd love to talk to you guys anytime. And, and obviously, if I do set foot in there, I'd love to have you all as guests, you know. And yeah, we'll show you around. A huge pleasure. Of course, we'll show, show you around. Show me what to see, you know, and all that stuff would be awesome. Mm -hmm.